Mahatam. Yeah, okay. They spelled it wrong. Right. Shayanas, which is the wrong A. Which one? Amala. On the board is Amala Shayanam. It's Shayanam. Right. Shayanam.
translation. Dugu Maharaj continued, O oh, unlimited Lord, kindly bless me so that I may associate with great devotees who engage in your transcendental loving service constantly as the waves of a river constantly flow. Such transcendental devotees are completely situated in an uncontaminated state of life. By the process of devotional service, I shall surely be able to cross the Neshit ocean of material existence, which is filled with the waves of blazing fire-like dangers. It will be very easy for me, for I am becoming mad to hear about your transcendental qualities and pastimes, which are eternally existent. Report. The significant point in Dhruva Maharaja's statement is that he wanted the association of pure devotees. Transcendental devotional service cannot be complete and cannot be relishable without the association of devotees. We have therefore established the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Anyone who is trying to be aloof from this Krishna Consciousness Society and yet engage in Krishna consciousness is living in a great hallucination. But this is not possible. From this statement by Dhruva Maharaj, it is clear that unless one is associated with devotees, his devotional service does not mature, it does not become distinct from material activities. The Lord says, Satam prasangam mamaviya sambhado bhavanti hirkan visayana. Bhagavatam 3, 25, 25, only in the association of pure devotees can the words of Lord Krishna be fully potent and relishable to the heart and ear. Dhruva Maharaj explicitly wanted the association of devotees. That association in devotional activities is just like the waves of an incessantly flowing river. In our Krishna consciousness society, we have full engagement, 24 hours a day. Every moment of our time is always busily engaged in the service of the Lord. And this is called the incessant flow of devotional service. A Mayavadi philosopher may question us. You may be very happy in the association of devotees, but what is your plan for crossing the ocean of material existence? And Dhruva Maharaj's answer, is that it is not very difficult. He clearly says that this ocean can be crossed very easily if one simply becomes mad to hear the glories of the Lord. <coughs> Bhagavad Guna Kata, excuse me, Bhagavad Guna Kata. For anyone who persistently engages in hearing the topics of the Lord from Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, and Chaitanya Charitamrita, and who is actually addicted to this process, just as one becomes addicted to intoxicants, it is very easy to cross the nations of material existence. The ocean of material nations is compared to a blazing fire, but to a devotee, this blazing fire is insignificant because he is completely absorbed in devotional service. Although the material world is blazing fire to a devotee, it appears full of pleasure, Vishvam Purna Sukhayati. The purport of this statement by Dhruva Maharaj is that devotional service in the association of the devotees is the cause of the development of further devotional service. By devotional service only is one elevated to the transcendental planet for Loka Vrindavan, and there also there is only devotional service. For the activities of devotional service, both in this world and in the spiritual world, are one and the same. Devotional service does not change. The example of a mango can be given here. If one gets an unripe mango, it is still a mango, and when it is ripe, it remains the same mango, but it has become more tasteful and relishable. Similarly, there is devotional service performed according to the direction of the spiritual master and the injunctions and regulative principles of Shastra. 
and there is devotional service in the spiritual world rendered directly in association with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But they are both the same. There is no change. The difference is that one stage is unripe and the other is ripe and more relishable. It is possible to mature in devotional service only in the association of devotees. Om Gyanati Maram Dasya Gyananjana Salapaya Chakshu Om Nidham Hina Tazmai Shri Nurve Namaha Pukam Kuroti Vachalam Bhangam Bhangayati Mahinda Kipata Mahamande Shri Guru Nidhataranam Nama Om Vishnu Gadaya Krishna Pristaya Utrale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namane Namaste Saraswati Devi Gaurangani Pichadane Hiru Shesha Sanivari Vasta Chade Sitarane Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Pramanityananda Shri Dvaita Gadar Har Shri Vasudhi Gaurava Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Juga Maharaja's prayer uh, is being cited here in this verse. And in order to fully appreciate what's being spoken here by Juga Maharaj, I think it would be helpful to put his words into context of what's actually taking place. It's uh, important to understand, especially this verse itself, is really <coughs> brought to light <coughs> by our Acharyas and Srinathapavati Thakur uh, in his explanation of why Yuva Maharaj, upon achieving the darshan of the Lord, getting a benediction from the Lord, and after getting the benediction of the Lord and the Lord <coughs> leaving, Juba Maharaj was lamenting. And when <coughs> Maitreya and Vidura were discussing this, and Vidura heard this from Maitreya, he was bewildered. I said, just, Juba just got the darshan of the Lord. The Lord left, and he's lamenting. That doesn't make sense. Can you explain? <coughs> And uh, it's connected to this verse, and therefore I think it's important to put it into context. And also, when you put it into context, I think it will help us to even appreciate more what's being spoken here by Juga Maharaj. If we remember, Juga Maharaj was uh, forbidden by Saruchi to sit on his father's lap, although his brother Uttam was on his father's lap, Ruva Maharaj wanted the opportunity to sit as well, and Suruchi uh, was a little envious, and uh, <coughs> she forbid him to sit on his father's lap, and even said, if you want to sit on your father's lap, uh, you'll have to go to the forest, seek out the association of the Supreme Lord, and get a benediction from him that in your next life you can take birth in my womb. And then if you take birth in my womb, then, uh, then you can sit on your father's lap. Suji, of course, <clears throat> she had uh, some envious feelings towards Suniti, and in fact, even it's explained that Maharaj Uttanapad favored in some way Suruchi over Suniti. And therefore, because he favored Suruchi over Suniti, when Suruchi spoke these words, he didn't say anything. And not only was Juga Maharaj <coughs> infuriated by the words spoken by Suruchi, but he was not angry at his father, too, because his father didn't say anything about it. And therefore, he went to his mother, Suniti. When he went to his mother, Suniti, he was 
lips were quivering in anger. He was so distressed at what had taken place. And Suniti, <clears throat> she said to Juba, first thing she said, don't seek vengeance. Don't cause harm to anyone. That's the first thing. We quoted that verse yesterday, Taraskrita Ripalabda Kshata Kshipta Hatahapi Nasyatat Pati Kurmanti Tadvapta Kavayokihi. The devotees of the Lord are so forbearing that even if they're cheated, neglected, cursed, disturbed, insulted, or even killed, they're never inclined to seek vengeance. So the first thing she said, don't, don't cause harm. Just accept the words of fact. Soon she had some very good advice for you. She advised you to go to the forest and to seek out the Lord. And uh, certainly if you seek out the Lord and do whatever is required to get his Sangha, his association, you'll get the fulfillment of all your desires. And Dhruva Maharaj had some desires. At that particular time, he had some desires. And what were his desires? His desires is he actually, although his mother said, don't be vengeful. He was feeling in his heart vengeance. In fact, he was thinking of, he's angry at his stepmother, he's angry at his father, he's angry at his stepbrother. He got to sit on his father's lap, and I couldn't sit on my father's lap. Why? I'm his son too. <clears throat> All these things were in his heart. And in fact, when Dhruva Maharaj went into the forest, who comes? Narada Muni. Narada Muni always appears whenever he sees a good candidate for bhakti. Right? You know, you know, just somehow, you know, Krishna, he's as good as as Vyasa Dave said, Narada, you're as good as the all pervasive super soul. So Narada is as good as the all pervasive super soul. He knows that with some candidates who's there, wherever he is, he shows up. And, and what does he tell Dhruva? He tells Dhruva, you know, Dhruva, why are, you, uh, why are you trying to do this now? You're a little boy. And uh, you should just try to become even-minded, free from material anxiety, become peaceful, satisfied. Why do you have to go through all these things? And he even gave certain verses, he spoke of them, recommending how he could give up his material anxieties and become peaceful. And suggested to why don't you come back, go home and why don't you come back, you know, when you have, when you're more older and able to understand what you're getting into. Dhruva Maharaj said, your words don't touch my heart. So he said, he said, they don't touch my heart. I have something there in my heart. And what you're recommending to me right now is, doesn't touch my heart. He had vengeance. But he had only a, one way he could, he knew there was only one way to get it, the Lord. His mother told him to go to the Lord. Stepmother go to the, told him to go to the Lord. And Narada Muni said, okay, if you want the Lord, I'll give you a recommended process by which you can achieve association with the Lord. And that's what Dhruva Maharaj wanted. He wanted the association of the Lord. Why? Vengeance. And uh, Narada Muni gave him a prescribed process, told him to go to thank Muna, Mahavan, perform severe austerities and penances. He gave him the Vaishnava mantra, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, told him to perform austerities, to chant this mantra, and in due course of time, he'll get the fulfillment of his desire. Yes, I'll get the Lord. And as we know, Dhruva Maharaj, upon getting the mercy of Narada Muni, who's very expert, he knows how to dovetail the proclivities of his disciples in a way they can get the topmost benefit. So Narada Muni, being very expert in his instructions to Dhruva Maharaj, he dovetailed his proclivities, he performed severe austerities, he chanted the mantra, and as we know, he became very powerful. Uh, I think it was a period of six months, I think, by the time, six months, 
to six months. He controlled the life heirs of the whole universe by his austerities. And the demigods were and finding the fear, you know, choking. What's going on? They went to the Lord, and the Lord said, it's okay, I know who it is, I'll take care of you. <laughs> so then, <clears throat> the Lord appears. Where Dhruva Maharaj is performing his deep austerities, his meditation. And all of a sudden, Dhruva Maharaj is meditating on the Lord within his heart, his meditation breaks, he opens his eyes, and he sees the Lord. There's the Lord, the object of his meditation, now standing before him. And then when he sees the Lord, he becomes so overwhelmed, purified at the sight of the Lord, that he begins offering prayers. And he composes very beautiful prayers because it's recommended that in the association of the Lord and saintly personalities, that we should glorify them. <coughs> and then, if we have some particular request, we glorify them first, and then we, we make that request known to the Lord. In this particular case, it's the Lord who appeared before Dhruva Maharaj. So Dhruva Maharaj, he... Uh, composed very beautiful prayers, although he said, I'm just a young boy, forgive me, I don't think I'm very eloquent, but I'll try to say something. And he began glorifying the Lord. And within the context of those prayers, he had one request. One request. And this verse is that request. This verse is what he asked the Lord. Everything else was glorification, but this verse is what he asked. He said, my Lord, kindly bless me so that I may associate with great devotees who engage in your transcendental loving service constantly as the waves of a river constantly flow. Such transcendental devotees are completely situated in an uncontaminated state of life. So actually he's praying, please let me be in the association of your devotees. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, in his commentary, he brings out a point, and I also want to make this point, bring up this point, because we'll speak about it also. Hopefully I'll do it all within the appropriate amount of time. But Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur in his commentary, he says, he said, by bhakti produced from association with devotees, one directly meets the Lord. Then one again prays for association with devotees. This indicates that bhakti in the form of association with devotees is the cause of bhakti, and bhakti is the result of bhakti. Thus this verse states the opinion of the devotees. In other words, he's making a very interesting point that by association with devotees, one gets to associate with the Lord. When one gets the association with the Lord, what does the devotee pray for? Let me associate with your devotees. We see this in many prayers, actually. In many prayers, Prithu Maharaj also, before the Lord, he prayed, please always, let me always be in your association of devotees. There's another prayer, wonderful prayer. Haridas uh, Thakur, Chaitanya Bhagavan. A beautiful prayer composed by Haridas Thakur during the Mahaprakash Lila, when Lord Chaitanya manifested his Shataprahaya Bhava, his ecstasy of 21 hours, and he was giving benedictions to all the devotees and revealing to all the devotees who were assembled how he had contacted before and he had come before and appeared before them previously before uh, and, and just like many examples like Haridas Thakur, he told Haridas Thakur when he was beaten through 21 marketplaces he said, and that was before the Lord actually even appeared in this world he said, oh Haridas, do you know why you didn't feel pain? you didn't feel pain because I lie down on your back and I accepted all those beatings myself. And Haridas Thakur, he was revealing this all to Haridas Thakur in the Mahaprakash Lila. If we get into that, we'll digress. Although it's definitely not a digression, but still. It's, it's, we have to stick with the point. When the Lord said to Haridas, you know, what benediction do you want? 
Because each and every devotee was calling for them, asking what benediction do you want? And Haridas Thakur, in his prayers to Lord Chaitanya, he said, oh Lord, he said, I don't deserve any benediction. He said, because I never remember you. The devotees always remember you. But I never remember you. Please forgive me. He said, and he then he began describing various devotees who in the midst of great difficulties spoke about Draupadi. When Draupadi was in the assembly of the Kauravas and there was an attempt to disrobe her, she remembered you. And because she remembered you, you entered into her sari and you gave her protection. And he said, the Pandavas, when they were exiled in the forest, Dravasa Muni came. And Dravasa Muni requested something to eat. And they had nothing. But they remembered you. They remembered you. They simply remembered you. And then you appeared and you took a few grains of rice from the pot. And by taking the few, gra few grains of rice from the pot, then, then Dravasa Muni and all of his associates were fully satisfied although they were in great distress previously, but they remembered you. I don't remember you. I can never remember you. I'm not fit for a benediction because these devotees always remember you. Ajumil, he went on to explain Ajumil, he remembered you at the time of death. He called out your name and your devotees. They appeared before Ajumil. They gave him his son, their sangha. He deserves benediction because he remembered you at the time of death. One after another, many devotees he explains why he wasn't a devotee. And then he says, oh my Lord, but you're asking me to request some benediction from you. He says, please forgive me. What I'm about to say sounds very arrogant because I shouldn't be asking for something as high as this, but this is my desire. My desire is that you let me become a dog in the house of your devotees and let me only get their remnants birth after birth after birth. That is my desire. Haridas Thakur. There he is in the presence of the Lord. Presence of the Lord. And what is he asking the Lord? Let me become a dog in the house. Why? Because when I'm in the association of devotees who are always talking about you, I can remember you. So wonderful. This is my shelter. This is what it means. I don't remember you. But when I'm with your devotees, I can remember you. Because what are your devotees always doing? They're always speaking about you. They're always talking about you. They're always glorifying your activities. How can I forget you? Forgive me. Forgive me for being so arrogant and asking for something that I'm not really qualified. But this is what I ask. And then, of course, Lord Chaitanya, he was very pleased by Haridas Thakur's prayers. And he gave him the benediction. He said, birth after birth, you will be my devotee and you'll be the servant of my devotees and all the devotees there present. Ecstasy. Such a benediction. The Lord gave him the fulfillment of his desires. That birth after birth, you'll always be in the association of my devotees. So, this is what Juga Maharaj was praying for. He was praying to the Lord, let me be in the association of your devotees. Now, as we said, there's some very interesting results that appeared. After this prayer, Juga Maharaj continues his prayers, and then the Lord speaks to Dhruva Maharaj. And what does the Lord say to Dhruva Maharaj? First thing the Lord says, he says, Oh Dhruva, you will get the opportunity to achieve a planet, a fulgent planet. There will be no birth, no death. This will be the kingdom that which you will attain. And this was, of course, what Dribble was thinking, because Dribble wanted, he wanted certain things he wanted. He wanted a kingdom better than his father's. 
Better than his grandfather's. Better than his great grandfather. His father was Uttanapada, his grandfather was Lord Brahma, his great grandfather was, no, excuse me, Swami Bhuvamanu, his great grandfather was Lord Brahma. <coughs> he wanted a kingdom even better than Lord Brahma's. So the first thing the Lord says, you got it. <laughs> you got a kingdom. And then he said, until you get to that kingdom, you will, when your father leaves, he'll give you his kingdom. And you'll sit on his throne for 36,000 years. You'll rule his kingdom. 36,000 years, you'll rule his kingdom. And then you'll perform great sacrifices while ruling his kingdom. And you'll remember me at the time of death, and you'll attain me. And then he says, oh, by the way, your brother Uta, he's going to go to the forest and he'll be killed in the forest. And your stepmother, Suruchi, when she hears about this anguish, she'll enter into the forest looking for him. And she'll be killed and devoured by a forest fire. And then the Lord leaves. The Lord leaves. And what happens to Dhruva Maharaj? Dhruva Maharaj is lamenting. And this is what the question, this is what, this is what Maitreya told, explained to Vidura when asked this question, that <clears throat> why was Dhruva lamenting? He was lamenting because I can't believe it. The Lord appeared and the only thing he talked about was all my previous desires. He's going to think that when I pray for the association of the devotees, he must be thinking, because he didn't mention anything about it. He must be thinking I was being duplicitous and deceitful with him. I asked him, please, give me the association of the devotees. Didn't say a word. All he said, only thing he spoke about, you'll get a planet greater than your great grandfather's. And by the way, you'll get your grand you'll get your father's kingdom, you'll sit on his throne. <laughs> and then your stepbrother Utsum is going to be killed. And your stepmother Suruji should be devoured by a forest fire. He all he spoke about was everything I wanted before. And he was lamenting. Lamenting. Why did I have such desires? Of course we know the famous verse I came here looking for a piece of broken glass. I found the most valuable jewel. You know, Dhruva Maharaj was lamenting that he had such desires. And therefore, Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur says in the subsequent verses, he speaks about what Dhruva Maharaj is speaking. He speaks with disgust at his own desires. He said, actually, he said, I came before the Lord who would award all benedictions, and the Lord simply fulfilled all my previous desires. It says it was just like a person coming before a king and asking for some small grains, of broken grains of rice. He gave another example. He says it was like a dead person being treated by a physician. <laughs> what value? I'm dead. And the physician came to treat me. I'm like a dead person. He was lamenting in this way. And Prabhupada brings out, he brings out an interesting point in this connection. And, uh, I had his name on target. And uh, he brings out a point. Oh, yes. He brings out a point. It's in verse 31. It's later in this chapter. He says that, uh, he said, Juhu Maharaj regrets that although he was initiated in the Vishnu mantra by a Vaishnava, he still aspired for material benefits. That was another cause for lamentation. Although he got the result of the Vishnu mantra by the causeless mercy of the Lord, he lamented how foolish he was to have strived for material benefits while practicing devotional service. In other words, every one of us who is engaged in devotional service in Krishna consciousness should be completely free from all material aspirations. Otherwise, we'll have to lament, lament like you and Maharaj. <laughs> we hear this and we think, well, anyway, the world, that means we're all going to have to lament because none of us are free from material aspirations. What, what, what value is there in hearing about this that our future is lamentation? But actually, of course, Juba Maharaj's lamentation was genuine, it was spiritual. Spiritual lamentation is good. In fact, uh, in the 11th canto of the Bhagavatam, 
is a verse spoken by the Lord to Uddhava. He says, he's speaking to Uddhava, he says, having awakened faith in the narrations of my glories, being disgusted with sense gratification, knowing that all sense gratification leads to suffering, but still not being able to give it up, my devotee should be happy, remain happy and continue to worship me with faith. Because my devotee knows that even though sense gratification leads to suffering and he can't give it up, he will sincerely repent in his heart for that. In other words, he'll lament. Why did I do this? He'll lament, but he'll go on hearing about Krishna. In fact, Bhakti Vinod Thakur explains in Sri Bhakti Loka that this verse, Jatashwara Matkata Su, this verse, having awakened faith in the narrations of my glories, this is where Bhakti begins. The devotee has awakened faith and hearing about the Lord in the association of the devotees of the Lord. Prabhupada quotes the verse here, Satam prasangam amadeyu samadho bhavanti kirtan prasaya nakata dats joshinat ashvapavaga bhavadi shradharatya bhakira nukha mishati that in the association of the devotees discussions of the pastimes of the Supreme Personality of God that become very pleasing and when they enter into the ear, they go into the heart. Prasanga, same verse, Prabhupada says here. Prasanga, same in this verse today. Prasanga. And Prabhupada quotes, yes. Twai me prasango. And Prabhupada quotes the verse. Satam prasangam mama vimisamato. In the association of devotees, where one develops an attraction for hearing the pastimes of the Lord, then what happens? Enters into the ear, goes to the heart. Then what happens is that gradually one becomes free from his attachments. And it becomes genuinely attached to the Lord. Shraddha bhaktiya, shraddha bhaktiya, and what is it? Bhaktiya, 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 and nukhamishiti. Actually, Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur explains from shraddha, shraddha dati bhakti, from shraddha to prema, all the way, in every step, a devotee it always is eager to hear the pastimes of the Lord. It's every step, even in prema. Was that verse in the first, second canto of the Bhagavatam, the topmost transcendentalists who are freed from all material miseries, they derive their greatest pleasure from hearing the pastimes of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That's, where they, that's how they get their pleasure. That's how they become satisfied. In the association of devotees, in fact, Narada Muni, to, again, Narada Muni appeared before King Chimi Bahishat, and Narada Muni told King Pachini Barishat, a very wonderful verse, he says, in the place where pure devotees live, following the rules and regulations, and thus fully satisfied, always in hearing and chanting the glories of the Supreme Lord. In that place, if one gets a chance to hear their nectar, which flows like the continuous flow of the river, if one gets a chance to hear that nectar, which flows like the continuous flow of the river, he says, what will happen? One will forget about all the necessities of life, such as hunger and thirst. And one will become free from all kinds of a lamentation, illusion, and fear. This is what happens. In the association, you know, just like sometimes you get caught up in a river, and the river, you know, like sometimes we hear about these tsunamis coming, you get caught up, you can't, you know. You, you get caught up when it's flowing. In fact, that same point is being mentioned here in today's verse. He says, Dhruva Maharaj says that, he says, yes, he said, I may kindly bless me so that I may associate with great devotees who engage in transcendental loving service constantly as the waves of a river constantly flow. He's praying in the same way, as the waves of the river constantly flow. Let me get caught up in the tsunami. Because when you're caught in the tsunami, you know, you're helpless. And Narada Muni tells King Prabhupada Bhagavad you get caught in the tsunami, associate with the devotees who are always discussing what happens. That you'll forget. You, you won't even remember that you're hungry or thirsty. And you become free from all kinds of illusion, lamentation, and fear. That's why devotees pray to be in the association of devotees. It's such, that's what association of devotees means. And Prabhupada says, explains something very, very important point. 
And I want to end on one quote from Prabhupada, because Prabhupada always says it like it is. <laughs> Prabhupada, Prabhupada in the fifth canto of the Bhagavatam, and the, there was a very nice verse, and uh, I oftentimes cite it. And uh, it's, uh, oh, I hope I can find it quickly. Krishna, please. Oh, uh, yes. It's 5th Canto, 12th chapter. And the Yatro Tamashloka Guna Nuvada, Pustuya Te Gramya Kata Pekata, Nishavya Mano Dinam Nukshur, Batim Satim Yatshati Vasudevi. Who are the pure devotees mentioned here? In the assembly of pure devotees, there's no question of discussing material subjects like politics and sociology. In the assembly of pure devotees, there is discussion only of the qualities, forms, and pastimes of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He is praised and worshipped with full attention. In the association of pure devotees, by constantly hearing such topics respectfully, even a person who wants to merge into the existence of the Absolute Truth abandons this idea and gradually becomes attached to the service of Vasudev. Purport. The symptoms of pure devotees are described in this verse. Pure devotees never interested in material topics. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has strictly prohibited his devotees to talk about worldly matters. One should not indulge in talking unnecessarily about news of the material world. One should not waste time in this way. This is a very important feature in the life of a devotee. A devotee who has no other ambition, a devotee has no other ambition than to serve Krishna, the Supreme Personality of God. This Krishna consciousness movement was started to engage people 24 hours daily in the service of the Lord and in his glorification. The students in this institution engage in the cultivation of Krishna consciousness from 5 in the morning to 10 at night. They actually have no opportunity to waste their time unnecessarily by discussing politics, sociology, and current events. These will go their own way. <laughs> These will go their, they'll go their own way. A devotee is concerned only with serving Krishna positively and seriously. Prabhupada is saying that this is why we've established the Krishna consciousness movement. This is our facility. He established it for this purpose. Sangha. For hearing and chanting about Krishna. And therefore, if devotees take advantage of that, then the result is, is that they begin to really appreciate the value of devotees. <laughs> what could be more valuable than Devahuti? You know, just asking questions of Lord Kapila, and Lord Kapila say, told, him, uh, told her, Marashriya Kata Mishta Shinvanti Kati Ganti Chal Tapanti Vibhatas Tapanati Mangucha Tetsasa. In case hearing and chanting about me, sadhus don't suffer from material miseries because they're always filled with thoughts of my activities and pastimes. Oh, my mother, a virtuous lady, seek out the association of devotees. Become attached to hearing from them. Because you become attached to hearing, it will counteract all the pernicious effects of material attachments. That's how it happens. That's why devotees are always so eager to have the association of devotees, even when they get a benediction from the Lord. Then, and as Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur says, the devotee, by association of the devotee, he gets the association of the Lord, gets the Lord, and he asks, please give me the association of devotees. This means that by association of devotees, my bhakti will even deepen, be it even more deep, because I'll always be able to hear him about you in the association of devotees. Every learned person knows attached to material things is the cause of bondage for the conditions of all. But the same attachment, attachment is applied to devotees, self-realized devotees, and moksha dharma pavarta. Gate to liberation is, is opened. And that's what Prabhupada is speaking about here in the commentary. He says that the, the Mayavadis will say, well, you may talk about you may talk about this hearing and chanting stuff, but if you're, if you're simply becoming satisfied by this hearing and chanting stuff, but what are you doing about your liberation? Papa said, what are you doing for your liberation? 
devotee doesn't even have to think about liberation. Rupa Goswami, what does he say? That verse, Iha yasya hare dasya kamana mana sabhira nikala bhakti vasta asu jiva mukta su uchite. Therefore, anybody who engages his mind, his body, and his words in hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, he's already liberated. Even before he gives up the body, he's already liberated. It's liberated activity. The devotee doesn't have to think. The Mahi body say, what are you doing for your liberation? Prabhupada says, why do I have to worry about liberation? <laughs> this devotee doesn't need to worry about. This is liberated activity. Hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. So that is, that is why Jogha Maharaj temporarily lamented. He temporarily lamented because he was thinking, I prayed this verse right here. I prayed for the association of the Lord. The Lord appeared and simply remembered all my former desires fire on me. Why was I such a fool to have such desires? He didn't even hear. He's going to think I, I was, wasn't really sincere, was complicit and deceitful, and therefore he lamented. So, we should learn that from this example of Dhruva Maharaj that there's something higher than the fulfillment of material desires. And that is to always be in the association of devotees. That's the real meaning of this verse of Srimad Bhagavad I've already gone over my time. Forgive me. Thank you for your kind attention. Hare Krishna, Guru